And thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Rich Gottwald and I'm president and CEO of the Compressed Gas Association. <clears throat> and I appreciate you taking time today to join our panelists here to talk about the future of hydrogen. And I think we're gonna have a really good session here because what we're going to do and what hopefully you'll learn is how we all interact together and what portions of the hydrogen space we're focused on and how we're really working together to make hydrogen the to bring out the promise of hydrogen that we're hearing so much about. But before we get into that, let me go through some housekeeping materials here. Um, the mission of CGA uh, is to promote ever-improving, safe, secure, and environmentally responsible manufacture, transportation, storage, transfilling, and disposal of <coughs> excuse me, industrial, medical, and food gases and their containers. In working towards its mission, CJ regularly provides training and or training materials to educate industry participants. The information in today's seminar uh, was obtained from sources believed to be reliable and is based on technical information and the experience of members of CGA. Uh, however, neither the association nor its members assume liability or responsibility in connection with the information herein contained. The information in this session should not be confused with federal, state, or local regulations. The association recommends consulting with your internal resources and with counsel for your particular circumstance. This webinar will be conducted in accordance with CJA's antitrust compliance policy, which was distributed to attendees prior to the event. Session participants should avoid any questions or comments regarding specific business practices, proprietary information, or other topics related <clears throat> that could lead to potential violations of this policy. All attendees are gonna be muted during this presentation uh, to reduce background noise. Uh, please use the chat feature to contact event staff if you have any challenges. As Laura just explained, we're going to be using Slido here uh, in order to interact uh, with the audience. Hopefully you're all familiar with Slido. Um, it was on the screen here a minute ago, but the, you can go to slido.com and type in the event code. There it is right there. Uh, at H2Future, or you can also just point your camera at the, uh, on the screen there. Uh, once you're able to connect it, you'll be able to answer questions posed to the audience, submit your questions for the panelists, and give a thumbs up to other audience questions uh, in order to get that question to the top of the list. We just did a sample question, so I think we're ready to go. We will, con we will conclude this session by 2.30, and we will uh, work diligently to, to stay within that time frame. So let me now introduce my colleagues here on, uh, on the panel. So first of all, we have Nick Barillo, who's Executive Director for the Center for Hydrogen Safety. We have Michelle Detweiler, who we're trying to connect in. She's having a little bit of a challenge here, but Michelle is Executive Director of the Renewable, Renewable Hydrogen Alliance. We have Jennifer Hamilton, Technical Director of the Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Partnership. And we have Frank Wallach, President and CEO of the Fuel Cell and Hydrogen Energy Association. I'd like to invite each of you to share just a little bit about your organization's role in the hydrogen space, as well as your thoughts on the current hydrogen environment, challenges and priorities for your organization. And Nick, why don't we start with you? Thanks, Rich. So, greetings everyone. My name is Nick Barillo. I am the Executive Director of the Center for Hydrogen Safety. I'm also in a joint role with the USDOE's Pacific Northwest National Lab as the Hydrogen Safety Program Manager. And I'm a fire protection engineer but with 35 or more years experience, you might say. Um, so a uh, little bit of background. So I think that we can all recognize when we talk Center for Hydrogen Safety, that safe, uh, safety can be a, a deal breaker if it must be addressed for successful technology deployment. You know, with hydrogen, we have a great stable foundation, um, certainly uh, almost a century of it being used safely in industry, a lot of good knowledge and best practices that exist. However, now we're, we're turning to its use as a, as a fuel, and that's new to many who may lack the experience or expertise. They may not, they may not know what they don't know, and, and that leads to some dangerous assumptions like we already know how to use it safely, or it's just like any other flammable gas, or it's, it's far too dangerous. Um, Failing to address these knowledge gaps can result in impactful incidents and industry setbacks. So in my role with the uh, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory over the last uh, 16 years or so, I've really, we focused on quite a bit on communication. It's, it's imparting knowledge, networking, disseminating, informing, 
advising and revealing knowledge. It's all about safety knowledge. Ultimately, it's about connecting people with that knowledge. You know, communication of hydrogen-specific safety guidance can, from a trusted resource is a valuable part of the hydrogen safety ecosystem. And that's really what birthed the Center for Hydrogen Safety. Um, the center is a, a global nonprofit dedicated to promoting hydrogen safety and best practices worldwide. Um, we support and promote safe handling and use of hydrogen across industrial and commercial uses, as well as the energy transition. And it's a common communication platform, a global scope, and we want to bring the information, guidance, and expertise necessary to, to help all stakeholders. Some of the things we do are education and training, conferences, workshops, working groups. We, we collect incident information and share that with our members, help develop lessons learned, um, best practices, uh, certainly all uh, quite a bit of what we do. We're focused on applied safety. There are certainly other organizations that are more focused on the R&D um, side of things, but our, uh, our scope is really on that, um, on that applied side. So where are we at, where we're going? Um, as we make this transition, we'll talk a little bit more in the session today, but we're real focused on things like um, developing new training and, and e-learning materials, um, really, and really ultimately pulling the community together to help them work, um, work on issues and jointly and more collaboratively help take the burden off any one organization. Also to really increase that body of knowledge by bringing everyone into the, into the discussion. So uh, thanks Rich for letting me introduce myself and looking forward to the, your questions and, and hopefully provide some great feedback. Great, thank you, Nick. Uh, Jennifer, why don't we move to you next? Great, and thank you so much, Rich, uh, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, thanks, CGA, and <clears throat> my esteemed colleagues in hydrogen. Um, as Rich said, I'm Jennifer Hamilton. Uh, I am the t currently the technical director for the Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Partnership. Um, <clears throat> I started with the California Fuel Cell Partnership uh, going on 17 years ago, and my journey has been great. And so I am um, really enjoying uh, continuing that career uh, as we move into our uh, newly named organization of Hydrogen Fuel Cell Partnership. So we have been and continue to be a public-private collaboration um, with common goals and working to, uh, working to those common goals. We are unique in that we are a platform for government and industry to come together. Um, and that is something that was recognized by our members in our transition and, and really they wanted to maintain moving forward. So we're not an, uh, a trade association. Um, and so we are working to advance hydrogen and fuel cell technology to build a sustainable zero emission vehicle market that achieves our common environmental and economic objectives. And we are doing that by working under kind of three main objectives that our board uh, decided on fairly recently, which is to drive the market success by establishing successful market conditions, winning hearts and minds by showing the value, the true value of the technology, and being a trusted resource by bringing together those leaders and experts and producing uh, quality data and information to um, really inform decision makers. We uh, cannot do anything like lobbying because we have government involved, but we can certainly uh, provide the, the industry vetted information to the people who make those decisions. Um, and so, you know, we can talk a little bit about that, but, but policy is certainly, um, you know, that, that drives this market is certainly something that's important moving forward. And, um, you know, in California, we've led the way on this and we are now, as the Hydrogen Fuel Cell Partnership, wanting to expand our reach and share our learnings um, with others around the country. And so that, in that sense, we're becoming a national org and we look forward to, you know, helping where we can um, with all this excitement with the hubs and stuff. So, thank you. Great, thank you, Jennifer. Congratulations on moving to a national organization. Uh, Frank, why don't we move to you next? I mute myself. Thank you, Rich. I appreciate the opportunity to be on this uh, panel uh, along with uh, colleagues who are all familiar with each other. We work fairly closely at a lot of overlapping areas. But from my vantage point, um, uh, I am the CEO, President and CEO of the Fuel Cell and Hydrogen Energy Association. We are a Washington, D.C. based uh, organization. We are the National Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Association here in the U.S. 
have been advocating for fuel cell and hydrogen technology for over 30 years. And in, in that sort of national framework, you know, much of our activities are designed around providing the, uh, the policy um, uh, framework here nationally so that many of us can all thrive in this hydrogen space. We focus on development of uh, policies uh, that serve not just uh, our own uh, 90 plus members, but also just all kinds of issues that, uh, that need to be addressed at a national level. Our members uh, represent the entire spectrum of, of uh, the hydrogen and fuel cell space from um, uh, uh, industrial gas companies, automotive manufacturers, heavy duty vehicle manufacturers, uh, large energy players, consultants, um, stationary fuel cell manufacturers, and uh, so we uh, have a fairly broad net that we have to carry. Uh, with regard to some of the topics uh, discussed here, as I said, we do have sort of an overlap in, um, in some of the areas. While we are a, a predominantly a policy uh, organization uh, operating on behalf of our members, we also cross over into some of the spaces, um, not as deeply as, 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 as colleagues on the call, but we have a responsibility uh, under contract with the Department of um, Energy to provide some codes and standards support that includes a bi-monthly hydrogen and fuel cell safety report. We don't, we don't write codes. We don't, uh, we don't get to the level of detail that CGA or NICS operations do, but we have a, uh, a responsibility to sort of assure that, that there's a seamless connectivity among what's going on and uh, you know, working both with our members who, uh, who support uh, many issues in our working groups, but also try to assure uh, that all of us have access to information that is current and valuable uh, so we can go about our day-to-day -day jobs uh, better. So with that, I'll kind of turn it back over to Rich and uh, look forward to the rest of the conversation. Okay, thank you, Frank. So let me talk a little bit about CGA. So I'm Rich Gutwall, President and CEO of CGA. I've been here about four and a half years. <laughs> um, we are based in the, the DC suburbs. CGA has about 140 members, certainly the industrial gas companies, as well as uh, some distributors and those that provide equipment and materials into the industry. <clears throat> CGA is a trade association, uh, but we're a little bit different than most trade associations. And the number one thing that we do is we write standards. We are uh, uh, ANSI accredited, as well as just most recently in the past month, we became a, accredited by the Standards Council of Canada one of really a, a few, just a few organizations that have that accreditation. We're North American based, meaning we represent primarily US and Canada, but we do a lot of harmonization work around the globe, trying to make sure that the standards, whether in hydrogen or other places, are, um, you know, are, are, are the same as much, as much as they can be around the world. We have about 360 or so standards in our library, certainly not all in hydrogen, but many of them hydrogen. And I like to say that we know hydrogen. CGA wrote its first hydrogen standard in 1955. So we've been at this for a long time. <clears throat> the, uh, there's certainly a renewed interest in hydrogen and in the energy space, but our members have been uh, writing safety standards around the product for many, many years. And in fact, our members produce and move the majority of hydrogen around the world today. And whether it's gray or blue or green hydrogen, when it comes to safety, it doesn't really matter. The same issues apply regardless of how it's made or where it's made. Um, and so I think that is something that really resonates we be, as we begin speaking to uh, you know, new entrants into this market. For the moment, CJ is focused on what I call land-based uh, land mobility applications, cars, trucks, buses, things like that. We know, we'll talk about it here in a few minutes, but there's all types of applications for hydrogen. We're trying to bite off a, a small bite that we think we can manage, and right now we think that's land-based mobility. And there's so much work to be done with respect to safety, uh, <clears throat> whether it's you know, how you move it, whether it's be truck or pipeline or what other, other ways of moving it, how you store it, how it's used, how you load it and unload it from delivery vehicles into um, fueling stations, let's say. This is a whole new industry sector. And there is so much work to be done with respect to making sure that it's launched and implemented safely. And why is that? What's, why are we so focused on this? Because <clears throat> one incident out there could set back this entire, entire new industry, as well as I'll say the old industry. 
it really could delay the the impact uh, of the the um, the launch of, of the new what we call hydrogen economy. I'm happy to say here today, one of the things we want to talk about is collaboration and how we work together. And I think just from the four of us right now, you've heard how the different areas, some overlap, but not a lot of overlap. Um, uh, and we'll continue to, to differentiate how we work and, and where we're collaborating as we move forward with this discussion now. So that's CGA. Before I move on, do we have Michelle? Yes, we do. And I certainly hope that um, the noise in the background, no one can hear. Um, uh, uh, thank you, Rich. And sorry I was late. I was having some technical difficulties. But uh, can everybody hear me? We sure can. Okay, great. So um, uh, this is Michelle Detweiler. I'm the Executive Director of the Renewable Hydrogen Alliance. Um, we are a uh, Portland, Oregon-based nonprofit trade association uh, uh, based in Portland, Oregon, but our scope is really the entire Northwest. And um, we work on policy. We do lobby. Right now, we lobby in the state capitals of Oregon and Washington, Olympia and Salem. Um, and our mission is to promote the use uh, or the production of, renew of using renewable energy to produce hydrogen and other climate neutral fuels uh, to transition off of fossil fuels in our economy. <clears throat> um, we, like the TIA, have members that are up and down the value chain in the hydrogen space, um, including utilities and uh, tribes who are interested in diversifying their energy uh, portfolios. Um, uh, and, um, yeah, so, um, again, you know, we pay attention. We don't lobby on the federal level, but we obviously, with all the activity, pay a lot of attention to what is going on at the federal level. And frankly, um, it has been extremely beneficial and we don't feel like we are um, uh, sort of walking around in the dark trying to convince people that uh, this is a, a viable, feasible, um, and effective decarbonization, decarbonization strategy. So again, terribly sorry for my, my technical difficulties and I'm very happy to be here. Great. Thank you, Michelle. Well, what I'd like to do is start with a, a series of questions here, and uh, I'll ask the panelists, I'm going to pose a question to each of you, but I would say if the others have information they want to add on to that uh, question, feel free to do that. I'm not necessarily going to go around the panel, though, one by one, but I'm going to um, just ask a few questions here to get the conversation started. So, Frank, why don't I start with you? Um, you know, from the, from the national perspective, uh, here in Washington, what are some of the regulatory challenges you're seeing at the federal level and how do you see them being addressed? Uh, thank you, Rich. That's a, that's a pretty broad question, but one that is uh, necessary to, to sort of uh, address. And uh, let, me, let me start by, uh, you know, indexing kind of where we are. As most people who would be attending this call realize we are on a, um, the U.S. has put us in a, on a on a platform for really leading a drive toward more use of, of hydrogen in a, in, in a decarbonizing uh, policy effort. And uh, there were laws written uh, last year that kind of set in motion a great deal of, of funding and um, uh, you know, the ability for investment to take place. So sort of the, where we are is kind of uh, from the standpoint of that question is following on to that, uh, we need to assure that there are many uh, uh, there are no roadblocks and that there are many opportunities for those, those funding uh, uh, commitments to, to follow through. And a lot of the discussion that's going on right now in the wake of those laws is about permit reform. Uh, there have been bills that have been proposed, questions about how we utilize pipelines. Do we utilize pipelines? What kind of uh, factors impact storage? So what, we, what really is the next wave in, in, of, the, of the effort from a practical standpoint is beginning to align many of the existing regulatory and policy items so that as we introduce hydrogen, there are gaps. Many of the rules that were written around traditional fossil resources or even the renewable resources have evolved over 30 years. And we're now introducing hydrogen to a set of rules and regulations that may not be designed to accommodate hydrogen in its, in its best form. And uh, there really needs to be a lot of work by industry, by government, to start to synthesize the, the rules, adjust them, and make sure that hydrogen can be introduced safely and uh, reliably 
uh, amid all the other uh, the other types of energy forms that we, we use currently in the U.S. That's the big item that we're going to see happening a lot in 2023. And Frank, we heard from a few of us that, CJ included, that we're focused more on transportation right now. Mm -hmm. Is, are you, you know, specific? application specific are you looking at the whole hydrogen ecosystem it's it's uh, it, fortunately or unfortunately rich it's the whole hydrogen ecosystem uh, there are there are subgroups uh, you know as, as uh, Jennifer mentioned you know a lot of the a lot of the efforts at the hydrogen fuel cell partnership are going to be in mobility that's their that's their uh, their efforts there is uh, a lot of work being done by the automakers heavy duty vehicle manufacturers and transportation but we have to look sort of holistically at at the broad spectrum of production distribution and use and try to find, um, identify the areas that need the most attention and, uh, and focus our efforts. But, um, you know, our efforts as an association are uh, covering the, uh, the entire set of activities. It's daunting, challenging, and they're going to make for an interesting 2023. Okay. Well, then, to, to Jennifer, you know, this, this concept of, you know, fueling stations. And so you said that, uh, you know, you mentioned that Fashia has now gone... Um, excuse me, the, the California Fuel Cell Partnership has now gone national. So from what you've learned in California, where do you see the U.S. hydrogen backbone for vehicle fueling uh, in the next three to five years? How do you see that moving? Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, if I could just add um, from my previous statements that uh, for those on the webinar, um, I personally in the partnership have great relationships with Nick's organization, Center for Hydrogen Safety, with, of course, Frank's FCHEA and CGA, and to some of Frank's comments uh, also that, you know, when we've done a lot of outreach over the years, and me personally with first responders and AHJs, and, and you know, one of the things we, that we say is hydrogen's been around as an industrial commodity for a long time. It's these new applications that you know, we are starting to use it for that that's new to us, right? So I think to Frank's comment, that's where we need to see, and we have seen um, some of the activity, CGA, for example, your guys' you know, role in stepping up and, and getting involved more with this new hydrogen market space, right? And as well as the industrial. So I just wanted to kind of comment to that. As far as California, um, you know, we have launched a light duty market, nascent as it is. Um, it is launched, and both our organization um, and the state, just as some background, have identified that that market can be self sustaining within a decade, but there is work to be done. Um, so, my colleague Bill Elric has been uh, spearheading and, try and socializing a national mobility strategy that, um, you know, pulls together. The, all the activity in heavy duty uh, with the hubs, uh, potentially, and connecting ports and sort of building a framework or a backbone, if you will, uh, across the nation that way. And, um, you know, we have some documents we've released recently uh, for both light duty and heavy duty vision documents that, you know, put some benchmarks out there or some milestones to try to meet. Um, but, you know, there's still questions. Is that enough? Um, maybe, maybe not. Um, but I think that all the excitement around the hubs and the corridors, you know, we'll get some more uh, information and insight and a lot of activity around what that investment looks like. What does the production look like? Is it enough? Will there be enough scale? Um, and will there, the supply chain uh, development bring down costs? So, um, you know, we think in the the three to five year, the kind of the near term, um, with all the excitement around the hubs, that will get a, a much better, um, you know, uh, perspective on that. But I think also with our mobility strategy that, again, Bill's been spearheading and we're, we're working on, um, that we'll have a nice sort of story to tell of how that backbone can, can work with the heavy duty and then fill, filling in for the light duty um, and we're certainly not done in California. We still have work to do there. But again, um, you know, trucks don't stop at state borders, right? So, um, you know, when we when we did that heavy duty vision document, we really started to see uh, that play out. And then with the the hubs coming on, you know, it just really sort of was a nice uh, synergy there and and a good story to pull together. So, um, 
you know, I think that's going to be from what we see really building on that, um, the hubs of the heavy duty, um, with, without forgetting about the light duty. So, and as a fuel cell vehicle driver, I can <laughs> say we can't forget about the light duty. <laughs> so Jennifer, you have a fuel cell vehicle. Hey Rich, can I, I, yeah, can I make I a, make an added comment to Jennifer before Absolutely. we move on? Yeah. You know, I, I, Jennifer made a really, really good point about, you know, that, that, uh, much of the, the work uh, in hydrogen has been going on for a long time, and we need to kind of index a lot of this conversation around the fact that, that you know, we have, uh, you know, 11 million metric tons of hydrogen being used by predominantly industrial resources today. It goes on silently around the, uh, all of our activities on, on uh, you know, highways, uh, trucks are, are moving around, uh, industrial processes use hydrogen, it gets delivered, stored, tanked, compressed uh, rather silently. And that all of our organizations, uh, certainly CGA has been working with hydrogen for about almost 100 years now, Rich. Uh, um, Nick's been involved in it. And a lot of what we're talking about with these rules and, and needs forward is somewhat evolutionary. We're not, we're not uh, taking from the ground up a whole new set of requirements that have to be, um, you know, initiated that much of the efforts of all of our organizations are uh, taking uh, work that's been compiled and done uh, and, and, and redefining it in the best way that we keep advancing the industry. And I think that's an important uh, sort of platform for this particular uh, conversation today. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave with that but, and continue on. Yeah, uh, two points, Frank, you, you make a good point. We call it behind the fence. For many, for many years, hydrogen's been used without incident behind the fence. Now it's going outside the fence. And as we know, the public is gonna be dealing with it and the public can, you know, break a rock. So we've got to make sure that it's as safe as, as we can make it. Jennifer, I wanted to ask you a follow-up question. You, you, we have all types of different levels of people on the call today. You talked a lot about hubs. What is a hydrogen hub? <laughs> um, well, I think that term's been used a couple times, but now everybody, I think, at least I do, uh, I think about the Department of Energy, um, you know, uh, description of hubs. And it, from from what I understand from that standpoint, it's a production and distribution uh, with end users. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really around that um, different methods of production and, uh, and distribution. And, you know, I think they, I'm not speaking for them, but uh, as I understand it, they really want to see not uh, silos, but, you know, an interconnection of those hubs. And I think that's where I'm not trying to sell it, but, um, you know, uh, we're excited about um, the the mobility strategy in, you know, all of the activity in heavy duty. In California, we have a lot of projects going on uh, at, at our ports. And I think, Michelle, I know you've talked to Keith, and there's a lot of potentially activity with ports up where you guys are and, you know, connecting those and, um, you know, bringing the kind of connecting all the dots with the production hubs around the country, the distribution to where it's needed so that you have uh, enough hydrogen for uh, um, a mobility market, right, a transportation market, and, um, you know, the, the connection of all that just kind of is a organic story, I guess. Um, so yeah, the, the hubs are production distribution. Okay. Okay, good. Um, Rich, Rich, if I could, if I could just follow up on, on Jennifer's uh, remarks about a hub. Um, one of the ways that we characterize uh, the, what a hub looks like or what it is, is make, move, store, use. Um, all within, of hydrogen, all within sort of a, as yet to be defined by DOE, uh, some geographic uh, area. Um, proximity, uh, if you will. So, um, so that's just another another way to to look at it as well. Good. That's good, Thank Michelle. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Michelle, while, while I have you, let me. So, you know, much of your work is focused on renewable hydrogen. Uh, can you give us an example of a success you're having, as well as a challenge in using renewable energy to produce hydrogen? Um, certainly. Uh, one of the big successes, and it may, it may be small on the scale that most of you work on, but um, we are finally getting the state of Oregon uh, to warm up 
to the idea that renewable hydrogen has a place in the state's decarbonization goals. Um, Washington has been out, Washington state has been out ahead uh, on um, accelerating the hydrogen economy in their state since essentially 19, uh, 2019. Um, and we are now just kind of still in the study stage in the state of Oregon. Um, they published a transportation, hydrogen related transportation study last spring, and we just uh, we had had a request bill in 20, uh, in 2021 in front of the legislature to do, to have the state Oregon's or the, the State Department of Energy do a study on the barriers and challenges and opportunities for renewable hydrogen in the state. That was just published. Um, and we are finally getting some legislators to pay attention to a couple of, um, legislative concepts, which hopefully will turn into bills in the Oregon 2023 session. Um, so, you know, and there are also projects in the region. Um, uh, in 2018, when our organization was started, uh, the map looked pretty empty. Now in Oregon and Washington and a little bit of Montana, we've got about 34 uh, hydrogen projects, either in the planning stages, they've already broken, bra broken ground in their building, um, or they're sort of in the finance stage. So um, that's, that's very exciting. Um, and of course, the Pacific Northwest, uh, we just, we just submitted a hydrogen hub concept paper based on, um, the abundant renewable resources that we have in the region. Um, you know, the, the challenges are sort of certainly not, uh, restricted to our region. Um, uh, but it's the discrimination against that I, maybe that's a strong word, <laughs> but I see it as sort of the discrimination against hydrogen or its different, its new uses. And I also want to echo what Jennifer and Frank have said about this is the really the only thing different about hydrogen is that we're just talking about using it in different ways. Um, but, you know, sort of certain stakeholders throwing up obstacles or, or, uh, lobbying, if you will, for certain restrictions and requirements that really aren't imposed on any other clean energy technology or clean fuel. Um, and, you know, some of these, for instance, uh, getting to Jennifer's point about light duty transportation, this is a sector that we think hydrogen is completely suitable um, but we talk to stakeholders all the time. We say, you know what? In Oregon, we don't think, or in Washington, we don't think that, that hydrogen has a place in the light duty segment. And it, that, that's just, I, you know, I have a really hard time <laughs> understanding, understanding that. Um, we have lots of rural areas, uh, where the, you know, the round trip to a grocery store is 150 miles. Um, and you're probably towing a horse trailer and you're going over a mountain pass. Um, not the, the battery electric, uh, technology isn't really going to work all that great, uh, in that, in that situation. Um, and then, uh, there's always the emphasis on safety as we're talking about here today, which there should be. Absolutely there should be, but that is also tends to be a characteristic of hydrogen that people sort of throw up there as saying, well, you know, we really shouldn't use it because it's not safe. Um, which is, of course, not true. Um, and then cost. Oh, it's too expensive. We shouldn't, you know, it's too expensive. Um, well, you know, in, I think, 2010, a megawatt hour of solar energy was $378, and today it's about $68. I mean, we're going we're gonna to scale up, we're going to get there. And then, of course, the, um, uh, the, the big red herring of efficiency. So uh, I will, I will, I will, uh, I'm babbling. I'm talking too much, but I'll I'll just leave it there. Those are those are some of the the, the real challenges. So you know, one point you made there, and I we encounter this as well. The fact that when we talk about safety, we want to make sure that we're not saying, "Hey, this stuff is really scary. You got to be careful with it." We are trying to talk about it in the context of how do you grow this industry, and you grow this industry by slowly adopting all the right practices so that it's really going to just take off. So the incident doesn't set people back. I mean, that's how we try to position as well. We don't want to be the schoolhouse, the school hall monitor, but we want to say, 
this is how you handle this stuff. And if you handle it this way, your business is going to take off. It's a different take on the, on the topic of safety. You know, on the screen right now, I think, and I think Michelle, I think you had asked for this poll to put up, but the question on the screen is what is the most concerning thing about the future of hydrogen? And as we're looking at it, I think everybody on the line here, Laura, am I correct? Everyone can see this on the screen here? This on the... Yes, you are, Rich. Okay. So some of the things that are coming up, you know, what's the most concerning thing about hydrogen? I've seen Hindenburg a few times. Infrastructure, efficiency. H2 was not perceived as a component of decarbonization. Uh, the source of electricity produced the hydrogen. The mistaken belief that following code is the same thing as being safe. A lot of different topics being raised here around the future of hydrogen. Interesting. Well, let me move on to, let me move on to Nick here. Nick, um, CHS has as part of its mission training, safety training. Where do you see training needed and how do you see it driving the hydrogen transition forward? Yeah, Rich. Um, well, I could probably sum it up in four words, but I'll be more, <laughs> be more talkative than that. But training will be critical. Um, with global support and funding growing worldwide, we're quickly moving from research and demonstration activities to commercialization and greater public visibility. Uh, much effort has been spent on hydrogen research and development, and on another front, codes and standards are beginning to mature for some common applications. Now, with hydrogen's move from concept to implementation, working safely and applying best practices brings the need for training and education to center stage, where effort in the other areas could be wasted. Um, as mentioned in my introduction, hydrogen's use as a fuel is new to many. This includes stakeholders, approval authorities, first responders, and those working with or exposed to hydrogen and fuel cell technologies. Uh, training and education will be critical to help those groups successfully bridge the gap between their confidence in handling existing fuels and their perceptions or insecurities in moving to hydrogen. Um, we have certain, uh, we've certainly seen this proven out in our training with first responders and code officials over the past decade. Thanks to, to Jennifer and the Fuel Cell Partnership, we've, we've worked quite a bit in this area. And during many of those training sessions, attendees began the training with significant apprehension. The training and, uh, and engaged discussions resulted in many exiting the session with greater confidence, and some expressed support for seeing hydrogen technologies move forward. Jennifer, you probably could, can share my, uh, my conclusion on that as well. Um, Absolutely. We at the center are developing uh, fundamental e-learning courses and instructive webinars. We currently have more than 20 courses on a hydrogen safety fundamental credential. Um, course content is developed by the hydrogen safety panel with support and feedback from the community of more than 100 member organizations. And we intend to, to continue to provide impactful courses and webinars to meet the growing needs of the community. Um, also, we will also need to uh, consider uh, education at the early stages of workforce development. And this is one area that really opens up an opportunity. Um, this includes integrating hydrogen and hydrogen safety into technical and trade schools, colleges, and universities. And we're really going to have to think about a graded approach in this area as the workforce and personnel demands ramp up. Developing the framework now will, be, will ensure that we are well prepared for the wave of demands for a skilled and trained workforce. And that's, maybe that's the thing that I can end this, my, uh, my discussion here a little bit on is that we're, we're seeing a wave coming. There's been a lot of focus on R&D, a lot of focus on codes and standards, but now we're seeing this wave coming with hubs and, and this more than $500, uh, $500 billion of, of investment worldwide that's going to demand a workforce. And that workforce failure to, to train that workforce and have them prepared can result in incidents. And, and as we've heard Rich, you said, and, and some others have said, that can really set the industry back. Nick, as you were, as you were going, uh, speaking there, you know, on the screen is a question, what, what hydrogen safety topics do you think are the most critical from an education standpoint? And one of the items, which is scrolled off the screen right now, but it said public perception a public awareness of general safety for high, uh, hydrogen utilization. I think what you, your, your focus primarily on, is it fair to say primarily on first responders and uh, in, uh, workforce safety? So we're, we're actually, um, you know, we've been at this for a while now and, and both of the Pacific Northwest National Lab, the, the California Fuel Cell Partnership at the time, we've, we've had um, lots of discussions there's, there's this sort of this propensity to say that 
that we just need to focus on one area. But I think the reality is, while I share with you the need for e-learning and training, um, the need for information, safety information for the public is going to grow as well. Um, we've actually held a workshop in that area um, and, and want to continue doing work in that area moving forward. I think it, ultimately this comes down to a, a challenge, though, and, and it's one that maybe was pitted with mines in, in a minefield. You know, what information do you share? When do you share it? How do you share it? All those kind of questions become very critical when you're dealing with different audiences. We had identified 13 different public audience groups, and the reality is many of those groups need different types of information at different times. And, and the content, the messaging, um, the way it's framed will have a big impact on how things are received. And, and so it, uh, it's a big challenge. So we're trying to work in all those areas, Rich, to, to yeah. address some of that. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. When, uh, yeah, I, I think, oh, sorry, Rich, can I just make one Absolutely. comment? I think, um, you know, Nick mentioned some of the great resources on the, the Center for Hydrogen and Safety, um, you know, that live, live at the center. And, the center is an international organization and there is absolutely, you know, a lot of um, work going on in safety codes and standards um, that, you know, I think are just unknown just because of the kind of, that's just the way it sort of is. But so um, getting the word out or, and making people aware that those resources are available has, I mean, I, I think Nick, you can agree, has always been kind of challenging. Um, and the center has a great job with the social media and things like that. But, you know, that's part of, um, you know, what we need to work on is not only making the resources and then making people know that they're out there and making them aware of it. So. Yeah. And thanks. Th thanks, Jennifer. And one more point. Sorry. Sorry. That might've been Michelle. I cut off. Uh, no, one more off point. Nick, okay. Okay. Oh, sorry, Frank. <laughs> um, one more point I'd like to make based on some of the questions I'm seeing popping up is that every, every fuel that we have has hazards. I mean, yep. that's a key part of the messaging is that you're using fuels today that have hazards mm -hmm. and, and you're doing it comfortably, if not complacently in doing that. And we're seeing literally thousands of incidents a year um, in the U S alone on, on whether it be propane or gasoline, um, natural gas, all these. And it's, it's one of these where we've, we've got to take that next step with hydrogen and help people realize that, that it's another fuel. It can be used safely, but we need to do the right things to use it safely. Rich and, and, and Nick, and, go ahead, Jennifer. Uh, this is Michelle. I was just, I was Michelle. just going to say, it's also really, really important to reach out to those groups and those stakeholders that, <clears throat> you know, whether, you know, maybe not intentionally, but are, providing information on hydrogen hazards that, that maybe are not well researched. Um, we had we had an incident here in Oregon where um, our local gas distribution, natural gas distribution utility uh, was going to the Public Utility Commission to do um, a, a pilot project that they had been researching for two years in their test in their test facility with no you know no problems and it was a five percent hydrogen blend project um, in, a, in a community in, in Oregon. And um, before they could even get to the Public Utility Commission, certain stakeholders went door to door in the neighborhood and started talking about the safety hazards and the air quality issues and the explosive hazard and all this kind of thing to the point where the utility pulled the project. Um, and so, you know, we, RHA, are trying to reach out to those types of stakeholders and say, can we please sit down and have a conversation, and we, we have the resources. I mean, you know, I rely on the Center for Hydrogen Safety all the time, um, and to be providing this information as much as I possibly can, and I am constantly giving it to legislators. Um, so just wanted to add that. Thanks. Actually, I, I, one comment, and we got a bunch of questions, but Nick and, and uh, Jennifer, Michelle, you all, we all raised something that, um, and it's indicative of this particular call on this forum, we all as, as leading associations kind of operate in different spheres and, and different needs. There's a lot of data, there's a lot of information that happens at, at, at levels. And it, it's important to point out that the way that we message has different stratifications and, and there's very granular detailed level that's very technical, uh, first responder level work, there's specific work like when Jennifer and, 
and, and Bill's group is talking about mobility. They're going to be very focused on, on the things that impact local uh, concerns. And, and we all kind of uh, have our, our need to, um, to message. And you know, within a, an organization like FCHA, there's, even if it isn't hugely technical and precise, there's a need to, to mes message around a sort of degree of reassurance that at the congressional level or the state leadership level, uh, people who write laws and, and, and are advocating for policies need to understand that there, there are mechanics underway that organizations like CGA and, and Nick's uh, organization, Center for Hydrogen Safety, are doing things. They don't necessarily care about the details, but they want to know that there's work going on to make sure that there isn't some fumble down the road. Um, and a lot of our kind of work is just keeping people abreast of the fact that there is there's a huge apparatus of activity happening in the wake of the work that Congress or state legislators even do, and that they can just go about the regular routine of government while all the other experts are trying real hard, along with the DOE, to just make sure there's no gaps. And um, so there's a lot of different levels of messaging uh, from very precise up to, um, you know, sort of broad spectrum. And we all, we all take our own place in this and, uh, and coordinate. Yeah, Frank, I think that's a good point. You know, we, in our present, one of our presentations, we talk about how people will get on an airplane or they'll take a, 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 an aspirin because they know there's some sort of standards guiding that. They don't need to know what the standards are, but they have confidence that someone has looked at it, someone has deemed it safe. What we're trying to do, you know, over the past year or so, we've participated, like I think many of you as well on the, on the panel here as well, we presented, I think, at 11 conferences, uh, large conferences focused on the hydrogen economy. And we have a presentation that's very high level, talking about the, you know, the value of safety and making sure the product is safe in order for your business to take off. And, and it's a way of just trying to educate these folks, the, the emerging industry, that standard, there are standards out there and there's more standards needed. And here's a place, here's one place you can go to help write those standards like it's, it's it's so basic at this point because uh most folks don't really know i would say that our organizations like cj even exists and we're trying to introduce ourselves to them because we i think we have a lot to offer them in terms of proven practices and not to make light of it but oftentimes when you start getting into those codes and standards people's eyes glaze over so oh. <laughs> it's sometimes just you know, suffice it to say, there's a whole lot of work being done <laughs> behind the curtain <laughs> on this. <laughs> That's right. We try to we try to in, not put the word standards in our topic on our presentation title because people will skip it, right? But you'll be talking yeah. about you know how to grow your industry, <laughs> and they come in and like, oh, it's about safety and standards. Um, we have some questions that are coming in through Slido, and so um, you know, whoever wants to take this, but with so much interest in the hydrogen infrastructure. Is there any true standardization planned? That's a. Um, I can, I can sort of touch on that, and I, I know there's there's different levels. I, I think um, there is a lot of different ways in which standardization occurs. I'm not sure there's going to be one optimal. And I like my other panelists to comment on this. You know, if if there's. I don't think there's one universal standardization that can apply to every particular application because you've got, you know, on onboard vehicles, you've got storage, you've got, uh, you know, compression, you've got a whole series of things. Um, my comment is there's a lot of degrees of standardization occurring where it's appropriate, um, but a true standardization might be uh, just outside the boundaries of, of kind of reality. It's more of a sum of the parts. And I'll let my panelists kind of comment further on that. Yeah, anyone? No, I, I would agree. That's why I said, um, because there's <laughs> that's a big question. Um, there's absolutely standardization happening in various, you know, elements of the infrastructure. Um, any everything from components to, you know, uh, you know, station equipment and, you know, all kinds of of things. So um I I I don't know if that's where the question is leading or if it's more to the uh, standardization of a rollout plan for infrastructure. Um, and again, I would think that would be, you know, um, dependent on the specific area and jurisdiction. But, um, 
you know, you know for like for the uh, our, my organization, for example, has put out some vision documents for for how that could happen, right, and roadmaps and things like that. But that's not necessarily standardizing uh, the infrastructure plan. So, so this is this is Michelle. So I'm I you know I'm I'm wondering about. I feel like maybe in in terms of let's just take it down to the refueling station level as far as standardization of equipment and mm -hmm. equipment that the that the public handles. Um, I think that at this point, what there are two kinds of nozzles for hydrogen fueling pumps, right? There's a 350 bar pressure pump that has a particular nozzle, and then there's the 700 bar for which has another nozzle. Um, I think that's really an advancement over, for instance, the battery electric vehicle segment where my understanding is, at least initially, I think there's more standardization starting to happen, but you, you at one point had many different types of plugs mm -hmm. um, and you sort of didn't know if you were pulling up to a public charging station, whether your vehicle was going to fit that plug. Um, and I think that that's, that's maybe an obstacle that the, that the, at least in the vehicle segment, the hydrogen industry has managed to avoid. Um, but, but Jennifer, certainly correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but I feel like that's one advantage that, that, sure. this, that hydrogen has. Yeah, um, that's a good example. I can say from CJ's perspective, Certainly, there's a lot of standardization underway, but as Frank noted, it, there's so many areas that need to be standardized, that need to be addressed, that, you know, we're kind of picking and choosing. Um, today, I see on the CJ web, CJ library, I think we have around 25 standards in hydrogen. And we, some, of the, some of the newer ones that are under development, most of the oldest standards tend, tend to deal with uh, industrial production and transportation and storage, but the ones that are underway now are design and operation of fuel, uh, fueling and fill stations, uh, designing of loading and unloading vehicle interface connections, basically how the truck unloads into a, a hydrogen gas station. Mm -hmm. Hydrogen separa system separation distances, how, how close you can put a hydrogen fueling station next to a school, let's say, or, or in a neighborhood. So really sort of brass, getting into the brass tacks of the standardization. We also work with CGA, um, with our global, with our partners around the globe, there's four other, three other um, CGA-like organizations in Asia, Europe, and uh, in Japan. And we work closely with them to try to standardize the work that we're doing so that they are doing the same thing there. And then one last final point around CGA is that we're only focused up to the uh, nozzle going into the automobile. Beyond the, no the nozzle and beyond, that's like SAE, it's Toyota, but it's the company. We're focused on everything up to that point because that's where our expertise lies. And we're leaving it to others once it's in the vehicle, whether it be a car or a plane or whatever the case might be. Rich, yeah, to your point, Rich. Oh, sorry. Something to just keep in mind on this, um, that to the point of standardization, the complexity of standardization is not unique to hydrogen. Uh, you know, every look, we are in, we are a heavily industrialized technical world. Whether you're talking about electricity, telecommunications, uh, you know, heating and ventilating systems, every degree of what we touch in um, in our in our uh, industrialized modern world has multiple layers of standardization. And there's no universal standardization that can occur for any any one segment. And hydrogen has its own set, but it's not unique from the standpoint that it is going to be made up of multiple layers, uh, all all kind of being combined together. Yeah, good point. Yeah, Frank. and one last point, if I could, in that just to you know make the point that in hydrogen specifically, with you're absolutely right, Frank, and that's a good you know perspective to have. But for hydrogen specifically in our industry, there is a lot of work, to your point, Rich, um, for harmonization. So this is a global market because it really is. There's so much activity uh, around the globe and it really needs to be a global market. And so there's work with North American SDOs and international to harmonize the requirements such that, you know, the marketplace is, you know, my company, if I have, you know, made this part, this widget, I could go put it in a station 
in Europe and a station in Canada and a station in Mexico. And, you know, <laughs> um, there wouldn't be differences among those, right? Let's go to this next question here, which is a little bit of an take. Um, what is driving the growth of this emerging market? And is this driven by governmental policies? Um, how about you, Frank? you want to take a shot at that? Sure. Um, well, I think uh, the, the big driver behind this is, is, is really the, the, the worldwide uh, goal to drive to decarbonization. I mean, when you look at the, the government policies are sort of implementation tools. Uh, hydrogen, as we've, we've talked, has been around for, uh, for decades. And um, so the, the utilization has been mainly industrial. The drive to mainstream hydrogen into all forms of, of really fuel-based and uh, process-based uses are, uh, is driven by the worldwide desire to decarbonize. The other piece is the the drive, and this has been we, this has been talked about in a number of webinars. The, the events in, in Europe have uh, caused uh, nations to consider the value of hydrogen being generated locally as a way to have a more resilient and reliable set of resources. Um, the government's uh, stimulation that goes on around the world and government policies are really in support of the recognition that hydrogen has broad value, and we need to get it started and. And that's, that's the value of government stimulus, whether it's uh, what the U.S. does or what goes on in other parts of the world. But it's not just government policies. Someone didn't wake up and say, hydrogen is a great idea. Let's have a whole bunch of policies. The policies support the, the necessity. And uh, uh, that's the way I kind of see it. You know, there's a comment on the screen a little while ago that every 20 years, hydrogen is the new thing. Right. So what's different this time? That it's not the new thing. And, and Frank, I, I think you just, you know, it's, said basically it's the, you know, the decarbonization, the, the sure. people understand it's a real threat to humanity at this point. Yeah. Well, let me, let me add a little bit to that, Rich, uh, just briefly, because, you know, when they say it's every 20 years, I haven't been around for the first 20 years, 40 years ago when it was in a wave. I'm only aware of the last 20 years that it, that it might have, might have occurred. But there is a, there is a point that, when, when people think about 20 years ago or it's the next 20 years, there was a lot of activity in the, around the origins of our association really in, in the you know, late 90s, early, early 2002, 2003, where you know, hydrogen was viewed as, as, as valuable as an emissions reduction predominantly in, in mobility. It was, you know, we'll put it in cars and we'll, we'll reduce emissions. And that was kind of the kick. And it was a bit before its time because the, um, the, 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 the sense of all the infrastructure and needs and, and mobility was only one dimension, but it was the drive to decarbonization that 20 years later really makes it a reality. And there's also one other point in those intervening 20 years that we have seen a very quiet and positive evolution of the technologies. The automakers have been developing and refining, you know, the, the nth generation of fuel cell vehicle. The electrolyzers have gotten better and, 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 and more refined. The, the, the infrastructure to produce renewable electricity that is a big driver in getting the, 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 uh, the clean hydrogen has evolved immeasurably over 20 years. So that this idea that this, the next thing in 20 years might have been a very valuable point to make in 2003, but it's no longer valued, valid in 2023. There's so many converging points that make this far more realistic than it was you know, in, uh, you know, 20 years ago. So I'll, I'll leave with that point and let my colleagues uh, amend that. Well, I'll, I'll just jump in here. Thanks, Frank, and, and say that, you know, from a policy perspective on the West Coast, um, recognizing that climate change threat, you know, from, we like to say, from Baja, from, from B.C. to Baja, from British Columbia to Baja, you have got, along the West Coast, the trifecta of climate policy. So you've got low carbon fuel standards, you've got 100% clean energy, and you've got cap and trade in every single state up and down. There's no place to hide. These are, these are compliance requirements, penalties for non-compliance. So, you know, addressing the threat of climate change and using every single decarbonization pathways we can that, are, that we can possibly get our hands on is is really key and so having as many tools as they say in the toolbox is very important and there is a recognition that hydrogen is a feasible feasible viable um, 
worthy uh, tool in that in that fight. Well, and you know, the California Fuel Cell Partnership was started because of policy, because of the zero emission vehicle regulation in California, and that was started because of their goals for emissions reduction. So, and, and you know, we've continued over the years to we have the Air Resources Board and work as a member, and we work with the Energy Commission and the Cal EPA and so forth. So, um, that's you know, for California policy has certainly been a big driver. And then other states have followed suit, right? And um, so, and, and, and when we had funds that were, you know, allocated and specifically called out for infrastructure development, that was a real signal for the market, uh, for the industry. And Jennifer, my dream is a, is a national low carbon fuel standard. Awesome. <laughs> See what you can do about that. <laughs> I, I've got a question here that came in. It's not on the screen right there, but I just want to, <clears throat> wanted to put it out there as well. There's been a lot of discussion, I think, in, in, in the space as we look at moving hydrogen around and moving it in pipelines and, and blending hydrogen with natural gas and, and that sort of thing. Any thoughts from any of the panelists on, on that concept and where that will be headed? I will say from CJ's perspective, one of the things that we, we're looking at is, and, and being very aware of is the compatibility of hydrogen with existing pipelines. You know, there's some discussion of trying to use existing pipelines to move hydrogen around, uh, around the country, and that poses its challenges. But uh, whether it's the pipeline, or whether it's the, um, you know, valves and connections within that pipeline there's a there's a real challenge i think in whether existing pipelines can be used and there's the question well some people say well, can we mix five percent or twenty percent of hydrogen to natural gas and i think there's some opportunities there but i think that still needs to be uh further studied rich um i think it I, go ahead, oh, go ahead. Go ahead Jennifer, michelle go ahead no go ahead Okay, I just was going to say that, you know, there's an interesting example to, to study, and that is um, Hawaii gas. Uh, they have had a blend of synthetic natural gas because they can't, obviously, the islands, they can't get methane nat or natural natural gas, as, as it were, um, to the islands. So they do synthetic natural gas with a 15% blend of hydrogen in their system. Um, and that has been a system that has operated without incident for 46 years. Um, so I think, I think there are places where it's done and, and there's, there's lots to be learned. And I do, I do know that there are several, uh, natural gas utility, distribution utilities who are, who are, uh, working hard on this and doing a lot of, a lot of study, a lot of demonstration, a lot of testing. Mm -hmm. From my, my perspective, I think the, the subject of, of the hydrogen and pipelines and uh, is going to be something that is debated and evaluated and it'll find its own sort of equilibrium because it's not just about the, the, the material science or the components. You've got a lot of players in you know, the existing you know, pipeline industry itself has to kind of decide what happens with its assets. You've got regulatory uh, agencies uh, and, and then you've got, you know, safety concerns, local jurisdictions. There's a lot of things that have to kind of, kind of be churned around before all of this comes to a point where um, some, uh, you know, like a Hawaii's example of, of you know, was driven by necessity of the way they refined uh, natural gas on the island and, and put it into the pipelines. Uh, hydrogen was part of it. So there are plenty of examples of where it can work. And there are a lot of players who are going to have to kind of find the right way for hydrogen to be universally adopted. Uh, uh, one item I will make is that the introduction of hydrogen into a broader storage and, and pipeline system provides a market, aside from the safety, it provides an ability for hydrogen to kind of have a, a uh, financial liquidity that you can generate hydrogen somewhere. And if you know it can go into a pipeline, you can in theory kind of take it out in another part of the country. That provides a huge value to, to the development of hydrogen to have that kind of ability even in small pieces to be uh, small amounts to be uh, you know universally bought and sold 
but the, uh, the the regulations, rules, details of how and if we we insert uh, natural gas and pipelines is a pretty broad debate that are going to have a lot of players weighing in on. Yeah, you know, to that to that point, Frank, the uh, it was the Hydrogen Americas Conference, uh, Americas Hydrogen Conference. Anyway, it was held in Washington D.C. last month. In the opening breakfast, five hundred people sitting in a room. Everyone walked in, beautiful breakfast set up, and everyone in front of their seat had a you know, reusable water bottle that said BP. And I think what that said to me, you know, BP, the sponsor of this hydrogen conference is that these traditional uh, you know, gas and oil companies are looking at hydrogen uh, a big time. And uh, I think they'll be f helping to figure out how to move this around using pipelines and things like that as well. There is a question on the screen here. <clears throat> Hydrogen combustion results in lower CO2, but greater uh, nitrogen oxides. Power plants are permitted to a specific NOx lo limit. Will air permits be revised to accommodate? Now, I don't know about the air permits piece, but the, the, the comment that's there, I think, is getting uh, increased play in the press recently around the CO2 versus nitrogen oxides. Any comments on that and what you're how you're addressing that, that, that comment? Uh, I, can, I can sort of start at, again at a broad level with this. The, uh, the assumption is, part, the, the comment is partially factually correct, uh, that, that in, in certain types of combustion um, of, uh, of um, hydrogen, you do have uh, different types of NOx formations. But um, a couple of interesting pieces, and this, Nick, this came out in the, in the conversation I think we had in, in Rutgers University where, where um, there are some studies represented done by the University of California Irvine that looked a lot at combustion technologies and boilers and, and the, uh, the NOx um, uh, proportions attributed to uh, uh, more use of hydrogen were, were negligible or, or irrelevant. So there's a lot of ways, my point of this is not to debate the question, but there are uh, ways in which technologies that currently are involved in combustion can be revised and modified so that whatever combustion processes going on with more hydrogen uh, can be tweaked so that that NOx uh, proportion is negligible, limited, or, or irrelevant. The other thing to keep in mind about the NOx formation, especially when you talk about permits, is that, you know, the large air permit level of, of hydrogen, when you're thinking in power generation, there is a great body of work going on today by the gas turbine uh, companies around the world looking to see the way that they insert uh, hydrogen. They are going to be adapting, modifying uh, their technologies to assure that the degree that there might be more NOx emitted is going to be uh, limited because they, they don't want to be incurring uh, impacts on their users who have the turbines existing today or to be bought. And the other factor is that NOx is one of those items that in fact can be controlled. It is a combustion process um, a factor and that uh, we have been in the industrial and utility world uh, looking at uh, dealing with NOx, finding better ways to reduce it for, for decades. So it's a factor, but there's also a lot of ways that the, the apparatus of our ingenuity are going to gear up to figure out that it is something that, um, that can be uh, dealt with. And it may be dealt with to a level where permits don't need to be adjusted because the technologies just get better at, at addressing the factor. So it's... Um, it's out there, but it's also a technical item that has a lot of people working really hard to make sure that it's, uh, it's not a factor. I'll echo Frank's uh, comments. I mean, I've, I've worked in the utility world for the electric utility world for, you know, over 20 years. And, um, you know, for, for fuel combustion, power generation, um, you know, all the plants around the country are all issued Title V permits. And I can, and I can tell you, that they have in fact been controlling and capturing NOx uh, from those plants for, like Frank said, about 30 years using best available control technology as, as approved and constantly uh, being um, uh, made more stringent by the uh, Environmental Protection Agency. So this is definitely something we, we know how to do. Okay. There was a, a question on the screen a minute ago. I, I don't see it right now, but I just want to jump in and answer that. There was a question, where can I find hydrogen standards? I'll say from CGA's perspective, there's two things you can go to. Go to cganet.com, and we have, a, we have a, something called a hydrogen standards map. 
And it's all the hydrogen standards that we have broken down by transportation, production, use, uh, pipelines, etc. Also, we have something called, we developed this with our partners in Europe. Uh, it's called the hydrogen ecosystem. And depending, when someone clicks on the hydrogen ecosystem, it knows through the magic of the internet, what country they are, uh, are uh, accessing it from. And it will show those same types of things around transportation production, but it will show a whole variety of standards uh, from ISO, from CGA, from European groups as well. And it will show applicable standards in those countries as well. So cganet.com is one place to get standards. Does anybody else want to talk about where they can get standards from your organization? Yeah, I'll jump in, Rich. So um, there was a there was an online resource, fuelcellstandards.com, but that has now migrated over to h2tools.org, and that's tracking about 400 standards globally um, by region, organization, et cetera. And so that's, again, h2tools, h2tools.org, um, under the codes and standards uh, part of that, that resource will give you that, uh, that database. Thanks, Nick. And, and Rich, is th thanks, thanks to Frank, because Frank's organization is the one that's, that's providing the data to support that. Yeah, that's, that's the role. You know, we, don't, we don't write the codes, but we're the ones who have the responsibility to kind of keeping everything uh, populated on that website. So I'm glad you brought that up, Nick. It's, it's part of all of our doing our piece of contribution to, um, to assure the information's out there. And I see that Laura just dropped that website into the, uh, the chat. So let me just talk a, a couple of minutes about fueling stations. And maybe, Jennifer, we can start with you on this. And so I think California has the most fueling stations. And it's sort of your, your, your world. So the question is, what is the future of fueling stations, which is pretty broad. But you, what, what is the growth, uh, you know, what does growth look like in the next few years for fueling stations? Yeah, so in California, we have, um, I think we just opened a couple more recently, so maybe up to 58 uh, retail light duty fueling stations. We have three heavy duty fueling stations. We have, uh, you know, behind the fence transit stations. Um, and California is working toward the goal for 200, and our vision document called for a thousand light duty stations to support a million vehicles. And so, you know, we, we keep working with our friends uh, at the state to um, be pushing toward that goal. Um, as far as the future of stations, I mean, there has been uh, talk about uh, larger, you know, with the advent of heavy duty, larger stations that are capable have the capacity and the footprint um, to accommodate fueling dispensers for heavy duty and larger uh, vehicles with larger uh, fuel storage sizes as well as light duty. And there are some technical differences in that. Um, I won't get into the details, but, you know, it, so for example, the um, truck stops, you know, that have regular light duty car fueling as well as the truck fueling, that sort of model might be something moving forward. Um, as far as, um, you know, for California, we're, we're certainly looking at, again, meeting, you know, getting more uh, retail light duty fueling stations as well as heavy duty, um, but, but having those goals uh, moving forward. As far as the technology, I mean, uh, you know, we have uh, a fueling protocol standard. We have, as Michelle mentioned, standards for um, the hardware, the fueling nozzle receptacle hardware, uh, communications, things like that. But there's a lot of work being done right now. Um, again, all, along the lines of the harmonization, there was a, a project um, funded in the EU that is giving information and data into the ISO TC197 for heavy duty fueling. And so there may be some technological advances moving forward. So I think there's still a lot of opportunity for, um, you know, some, some new ideas uh, around stations moving forward. It's Can exciting. You know <laughs> Do you know how many um, light light uh, hydrogen vehicles there are in the country, the United States? Uh, we have a by the numbers page. I think uh, it's around fifteen thousand uh, right now, predominantly in in California. Um, light duty passenger vehicles, yeah. <clears throat> but don't wow. quote me. You, you can check that out on our website. <laughs> okay. We have a by okay. the numbers page. Okay. Michelle, anything you want to add with respect to fueling stations in the Northeast or the Northwest? 
Um, only that we really want them. <laughs> we, we, we do have, we do have uh, I think, two or three in development in Washington State, uh, and we are pushing very hard uh, to get one, at least in, in Eugene, Oregon, which would get you, get you from the last station in California, we believe, to Eugene, then to Washington. So okay. <laughs> hoping that ha happens soon. A question that came in during registration, I think it might be an interesting one for, for us to talk about for a minute. How can the participating organizations on this panel collaborate to show strength and unity on legislative and regulatory affairs? I think I was, we already well, do. I, yeah, <laughs> I ahead. mean, one one thing our organization is looking at, and, and I've personally spoken with, um, you know, other heads of organizations. I think Frank, you and Bill have talked about it. Is you know the common messaging, right? We really need a unified voice, um, and and so working together to come up with you know what that messaging is. Um, I mean, obviously, us on this panel here, we all have, you know, kind of singing the same tune, but but how do we get um, the entire industry to all have that sort of same theme and message, right? Um, because it's, to Michelle's comments earlier, we know that that exists for some other technologies, and that may not have fared very well for us, um, you know, and so we need to... It going into those decision makers have that that uh, common message. So, my perspective. Okay. And I think one example I'll just throw out here, and, and granted, it's not it's it's not necessarily directly industry or public facing, but as the federal government started to um, deploy initiatives to accelerate the hydrogen economy in the United States, and with all of the funding that followed. Um, there was a lot of cooperation. I mean, you know, we were all sharing each other's comments. We were on each other's phone calls, you know, hey, how are you looking at this? And what, what does this look like in your part of the country? Or what does this look like nationally? Or how are you going to respond to this comment notice? And, you know, that, that kind of thing. So I think, because we are, as Jennifer says, that the messaging is very, 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 very important. And, and we do have to be rowing in the same direction. Um, so, so I think uh, there has been a lot of co cooperation in that respect, and and I would I strive every day to to make sure that that um, you know we're all getting that all getting the word out and educating people and doing outreach as much as we can. There's another dimension to this as well. From uh, Michelle brings up a point that. Um, there's a lot of conversations and opinions that have been accelerating around the subject of hydrogen. And uh, there needs to be a bit of discipline in some ways by the recipients to, um, uh, of, of information. Well, we need to disseminate, we need to be uh, you know, cooperative. The recipients also need to be able to separate what is just conversation from those people who have valued uh, data, insight, and knowledge because if there's just so much noise out there, it gets really confusing. We've got, a, we've got an obligation uh, to kind of elevate the hydrogen in, in a way that, that is valuable. And uh, with that comes also the, the need that just chatting about a hydrogen or raising opinions that aren't based on fact and, and uh, you know, it, it is inefficient. And so there's a degree of, um, of cooperation, but there's also a, a degree of uh, you know, message what's important and uh, what what is meaningful to the uh, the evolution, and not just messaging for messaging's sake. Yeah, here, here. Yeah, I agree, Frank. It's we've got to get more, provide more more details, more actual studies, and and that sort of thing. Uh, let's see. We I think we have time for perhaps one more question here, and I'm looking at a couple of questions around the screen. Um, uh, and I'll take the, the one here that is, uh, are prescriptive codes and standards viable for H for hydrogen, or should we evaluate risk-based and risk-informed approaches? Any thoughts on that? Okay, so since everybody's being quiet, I'll jump in. <laughs> so I, 
I think that there is opportunity for both prescriptive and performance-based. I think what we've seen, especially maybe with light duty fueling stations in the U.S. and the experience of that is that um, as the codes are starting to grow and mature, um, in that maturation process, there's going to be gaps, there's going to be need for um, alternative means and methods. And, and that has been the case. I think, um, I think performance-based, some regions of the world, performance-based is preferred over prescriptive and, I, and, and it's working in those regions and I think that's good. I think, it's, I think in, the, in the US, I think um, their pres- uh, performance-based codes and standards are not well received by, um, uh, by code officials. It's just not a process that's really embraced well in, in the US. And, and then you have standards like the NFPA standards, which have chapters, whole chapters dedicated to performance-based and one of the challenges in that is, is that um, they're piecemealed out and used in, in a piecemeal approach, which was never the intent of those standards. But, you know, when you use Chapter 5, you use all of Chapter 5 of, of an FPA code and standard on performance base. You don't use, you know, 5.3 and forget all the rest. Um, and so I think that we'll, we'll be living with both, but, but in different regions, one or the other, I think will be more prevalent and, and be more um, accepted and embraced. Nick, I, I can completely agree with you that there's going to be a, the need for both. There's not, there's not a one or other approach. Well, I think we are coming up to the end of our time here, and I want to be respectful of your time, of our panelists' time, and of our audience's time. And I want to thank the panelists uh, here today who have shared their expertise. And hopefully <clears throat> what we're showing the the audience that there is collaboration happening out there. We're all trying to work together and this is another example of that and trying to bring us all together and share information. Uh, I've made a lot of notes here today and things that I want to follow up with each of you on and I'm sure you have as well. So I do want to thank Nick Barillo, the Executive Director of the Center for Hydrogen Safety, Michelle Detweiler, um, the invisible Michelle Detweiler, who is the Executive Director of the Renewable Hydrogen Alliance, Jennifer Hamilton, the Technical Director of the Hydrogen Fuel Cell Partnership, and Frank Wallach, President and CEO of the Fuel Cell and Hydrogen Energy Association. Thank you for your time today. And thank you to all of you who have participated on the call today. Um, we have posted a link in this session, uh, survey in the chat, uh, for a, a survey of this session in the chat. We'll be sending up a follow-up email with this session, including a link to the presentation slides and survey results. Please take a few minutes to complete it as we use it continuously to improve our events in educational programming. We truly appreciate your feedback. Finally, if you'd like to learn more about CJ's hydrogen activities or join our mailing list, please visit hydrogensafety.org. Thank you and have a great weekend, everybody. Bye.